It's all about humanity. Did you know? School Sport Victoria offers 650,000 sporting opportunities in 31 different sports. At 10,700 events across the state every single year. That's a lot of kids playing sport. And for over 25 years, the Victorian School Sports Awards have recognised more than 1,500 students, teachers and volunteers for excellence and outstanding contribution to school sport. Now that's a champion effort. Good afternoon and welcome to the Ask SSV show. We've got the very lovely Grace Brown with us. How are you, Grace? I'm um, good, thank you, Ralph. Very happy to be here. Yes, great. Well, it's good to have you with us and you're coming to us from within Melbourne City. Uh, hopefully the internet will cope with where you are, but uh, we're very lucky to have you on board because you've been um, certainly travelling around and you've just come back into Australia. So thankful that you've made the time to join us. Yeah, thanks. It's been a busy year, but but a good one. <laughs> yes, it certainly has been a good one. 2019 was good, but 2020 was fantastic for you. You came first in the, I don't even know how to say this, it's the Brabantse. How do you say that first one? Uh, Brabantse de Pil. <laughs> Yeah, that one in Belgium. You yeah. came first in that one, second in the uh, National Road Championships time trial, second in Belgium again with another competition in the Liege Bastoni. I think that's how you say it. Is uh, that right? 
Liège Bastogne. Okay, Liège <laughs> Bastogne. And then the Road Race Nationals third, and then a time trial again in the UCI, UCI Road World Championships in Imola, Italy. You certainly tried. That's just 2020. 2019 was again fantastic for you as well. Brilliant stuff. Out of these events, which one stands out the most for you in 2020? Um, personally, the uh, the one where I came second at Liège, based on Liège, yeah. um, that it's just a really high profile race. And for me, that was my first um, moment where I realised that I'm really at the top level of the sport. So uh, yeah, it was a bit, bit of a breakthrough race, that one. That's right. I mean, the, the intro video, I must work on that mute, that last bit of the intro video, but it looked like it was set up for you. It talked about cross country, which we'll talk about in a second. It showed cross country, we'll talk about in a second, then it started with cycling, but it certainly wasn't custom made for you. But that's been your transition. You've gone from distance running, cross country kind of running over to cycling. Is that correct? That's, that's yeah. how it was transitioned for you? Yeah, that's right. I, um, all through school, I was a runner. Um, yeah, and particularly cross country. Uh, yeah, many, um, many great uh, Team Vic moments there uh, on the cross country course. Um, and yeah, um, post university, I sort of transitioned into cycling. And um, yeah, that's where I really sort of found my feet or, <laughs> or pedal. <laughs> Well, yeah. that's it. Yeah, that's exactly right in terms of how it all kind of transitioned for you. But where did it all start? Like when we'll talk about the transition from distance running or cross country to cycling in a second. But yeah. when did it all start for you? This team bit cross country kind of setup. Yeah. So in primary school, um, I think, yeah, I just uh, I remember I had like this this girl in year six that was um, Sort of my idol and she was a good uh, good runner um, and she won the school cross country um i went to a small primary school so it probably wasn't such a big deal but i thought it was <laughs> i thought it was pretty cool so um yeah in grade three i think we were allowed to race the cross country for the first time um and i won it and then yeah went on to the i think regionals and then zone um, and then from zone onto the um, state champs. And um, yeah, I, I made the team pick for cross country and the first year that you're able to do that. And I remember being super proud and bringing all my team pick um, uniform to show and tell at school and um, yeah, showing the whole class my uniform and um, yeah, the whole journey of going into state to um, race at that national level was really cool. I mean, it, it would have been um, a, an amazing experience, but all the more so with what you just mentioned, coming from a small area, you you grew up in Camperdown. So Camperdown, um, although it's a, it's a fairly decent sized regional location, how large was your school in terms of population, your primary school? Yeah, the primary school maybe had a um, hundred or so wow. kids. Yeah, That's so, so cool. not so, not big. <laughs> I so, think. Well, go on, sorry. Yeah, uh, I when I so when I made um, the state team, the team pick for cross country, I think it was the first time my school had ever sent anyone to compete in That's any great. sport at a national level. So it was a pretty big deal. It would have been, and um, I'm guessing they would have got behind you and and really you know been quite proud of the fact that out of a teeny tiny school you know it's quite small in comparison that they've got this amazing national runner yeah i mean the whole um the whole town sort of got around it we <laughs> we had a local newspaper and i think i got you know a big picture on That's the back great. page of the local newspaper <laughs> as well so it was pretty cool yeah very proud moment and, and it would have been your olympics i mean back then for you as a great it would have been grade four so 10 year old that would have been quite amazing and and you know back then is when we used to sell raffle tickets to get you over over the line so you would have had yeah. no trouble selling <laughs> raffle tickets in camper down if everyone knew who you were yeah i think um i had a lot of support so yeah it wasn't too hard to to gather the funds to get there which was cool <laughs> and that's and that it started in grade four and then it continued on didn't it you you continued to make team vic teams for cross country and um, what was the drive for you to continue in cross-country running? 
Yeah, I think um, the the first couple of years it came naturally to um, run at that level. I didn't train that much because as um, a young yeah a young kid, you um, you don't really need to go too hard at that sort of thing. But then um, as the years went on and some of the um, other girls I was competing against got a little bit more serious, I. Um, and they started being like coached by, you know, proper squads and stuff. I sort of was a little bit behind because that stuff wasn't offered in the country town where I was growing up. So there were a few years where I um, didn't make the state team um, there. But yeah, then I like it was always a real goal to, you know, get, I think it was a top six or something at states, um, yeah. made the team for nationals. So each year that was my goal and, um, yeah, eventually I, yeah, sort of got the training together to be back at that top level, which, um, yeah, it was, I, I just always had that drive to, to be there and, um, yeah, be representing at that top level in Australia. Yeah, well, I mean, what you've hit on is, is an interesting concept that, at, you know, 10, 11, 12, you kind, of have this you kind of have this natural ability and it happens to a lot of 10, 11, 12-year-olds and then they suddenly realise that, hang on a minute, my natural abilities now need some training. I need to hit yeah. the gym, you know, when I hit 15, 16. And so that's probably the, the trend, you know, that what happened for you. But when did the transition for you happen into cycling? Uh, so that happened much later. Um, I continued running uh, cross country and I also did track um, okay. later in, in high school, um, like 1500 and 5k I sort of focused on. Um, and then I continued competing in, in my first uh, few years of uni. Um, yeah, doing all the track meets and cross country meets in Victoria and also racing um, nationals. But then I was quite an injury prone athlete. So um, I had a few stress fractures. I'd just recovered from a stress fracture to my tibia. And um, six months later, I got another stress fracture to the head of my femur. Wow. And yeah, I think if, if uh, you're a runner, you sort of know the process of you have these stress fractures, you have to do um, a period where you go to the pool and you do pool running. and. It, yeah, it's um, not the most fun <laughs> process. So I, yeah, I sort of realised that I wasn't going to achieve um, the level that I wanted to because of my injuries in running. And at that point, I um, decided to stop running and, um, yeah, get a bike instead. I'd had a few people say that, uh, you know, I had a lot of power in my legs and, you um, and cycling might suit me better than running. And they were right. Yeah, I picked up the bike pretty quickly and got competitive and really loved it. Well, I mean, it would have been, I mean, having power in your legs is important. And when you're running, the, the impact you're putting on your body, hitting the ground would be hard. Mm. And would it be right in saying that that is dramatically reduced on a bike? You still have the same power, but there's not that pressure coming back through your body? Yeah, it's basically a zero impact sport. So um, as long as you're all set up right on your bike, it's pretty hard to get an overuse injury. So um, yeah, I was able to use my strengths um, without injuring myself, uh, which was great. <laughs> and how the injury's gone since then? Since taking on the bike and, and getting on a seat, how the injury's gone? Um, yeah, I've been pretty much injury free in terms of uh, overuse, like from training. But um, the downside of cycling is that you sometimes uh, crash in right. races. Right. So I've had been involved in uh, yeah a few crashes and had some nasty injuries out of that. But yeah, you, you get back on the bike pretty quick um, once the body heals over and get going again. So. Well, I mean, it would, yeah, it certainly um, wouldn't be. I mean, the crash is hard because mm -hmm. at least with an an injury, you can kind of feel something coming. But with a crash, it, it must be just you didn't even have that on your radar and 
it happened. Yep. Yeah. So it just, uh, I mean, it's traumatic as well, crashing. Yes, so, yes. So there's that aspect, the, the mental uh, aspect of returning to being in a bunch of other cyclists yep. um, and going fast can be hard. But, um, yep. yeah, the injuries, you know, you can, I've broken my um, clavicle here and, like, I got, yeah. that, I got that plated and was back on the bike within a week. So it's um, you can turn it around pretty quickly. You're a machine. That's amazing that you did that. In so, I mean, that is phenomenal. Just coming back to your Team Vic experience, what was it that, if I ask you this question, what stands out in your Team Vic experience? What sort of comes to mind in relation to that before we go back to talking about cycling? Um, I think, you know, one of the things that's, um, stayed with me even today is some of the connections that I've made um, from being on Team Vic. There's, there's girls um, that I yeah, was on the team with that I still know today and um, I'm connected with. And I think, yeah, that's been, that's been really cool. Um, even though I'm not in running anymore, uh, yeah, just that, that sort of journey that you shared together as kids and... Um, yeah, the aspirations that you share as well. I mean, you're in good company. There's so many good runners that have come through Team Vic with Lyndon Hall, yeah. Kelly, Kelly Peel, um, Lee Hetherington, um, even in the boys, uh, Luke Matthews, um, there's Jemima Russell. Uh, there's so many amazing athletes that have come through that you, you're in good stead. How did you go transitioning to cycling? Because that's, I wouldn't imagine that would be a natural thing to do. So... How did that go for you? Yeah, um, it, it wasn't too bad, actually. The cycling community is very welcoming. Um, there's lots of social bunches and the clubs are always looking for new members to join. Um, and if you're new, they uh, really help you out with skills and riding in a bunch and teaching you how to race. Um, and particularly for women, like there's a real impetus to get more more women cycling so um it's really supportive and i yeah i quickly made friends in cycling and um yeah i got to know my competitors you know there's always that bit where you know a new kid on the block they're like who's this person who's trying to beat us all um but yeah it, like now now i'm well in the mix of the cycling community <laughs> And it sounds like a great community and, and you certainly travel a lot. But in 2018, 19, we talked about, you know, the Australian time trials and in came first and the women's tour down under. There's so many different races with time trials, with, with the tour down under, with the other ones that we talked about, um, the, the, the um, road championships. Do you have a favourite? Is there one that you really look forward to being part of? Um, yeah, on the, so the international level, um, there's a period of racing in the European spring, so um, March and April. It's called the, the Classics, and they are one-day races, and they tend to be um, over, like, sort of, like, cobbles and um, just, like, really dynamic, hard races, um, and, yeah, they're my favourite. And so, I mean, it must be very different being part of that, but just explain... For those of us that don't know about the difference in the races, just you know what the what the difference is. I've got some vision here of the 2019 race that you're part of, but just explain what the differences are. Yeah, so um, that video there is um, from the Tour Down Under, which is yeah. uh, basically the biggest um, race in Australia at um, the like World Tour international level. So, um, and you first at this one. Uh, I came first on a stage. So, on a stage, sorry. Yeah, yes, that's so right. for us, this oh, is four, four days. Um, and basically, yeah, you each day you race and someone can win that day. So I won yeah. a day. But then there's also um, someone who wins overall. So it's like the cumulative time. If you're, like, highest placed on each stage overall then you win the race overall um and so that that's a tour and then there's one day races where it's all about that day 
Um, and then the time trial is like a separate discipline, um, which is an individual race against the clock. So not everyone does that. Um, you tend, tend to have to be a bit of a specialist um, in that to want to do it because it's pretty brutal, but that's something that I do. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, the, the the difference being that in these races that we're looking at now, it's very much an individual kind of race, isn't it? Whereas in a tour, correct me if I'm wrong, if it's a day, it's individual, but in a tour, you compete as a team. Is that accurate in saying uh, that? So all the races you competed as, as a team, apart from the individual time trial. Right. So yeah. even in a one-day race, we will have um, a leader for the day. And, um, yeah, so we will work our tactics um, best, to best suit that one rider uh, who has the best chance of winning. Um, yeah, it's quite quite complicated, but uh, if you watch a race and um, listen to the commentary, it's uh, a good way to learn the tactics and understand what's actually going on. <laughs> Yeah, it would be, and it, it is. It's kind of countercultural when you think about it. When you think about racing as a as a team sport, like let's take you know one of the most um, used examples is AFL. The team wins the premiership. It's not just an individual, but in cycling, it's a team. But to use the AFL analogy, only one person would get the Norm Smith medal and that's it kind of thing. There's only one thing that they get, that that team member goes forward. Is that accurate? Yeah, so the, uh, only one person stands on the podium, we say. Yeah, but, um, yeah. yeah it's widely recognised um, that it's a whole team effort. So, for instance, um, I think, yeah, I can sort of explain some examples that might happen in a race. Um, yeah. Often there might be a group or an individual that breaks away from the main um, peloton, which is the big bunch of riders. Mm -hmm. And um, if that rider is a threat to our um, chances of winning the race, we will put some of our team members on the front of the bunch to chase them down. So they're using their energy while our leader is sitting behind, um, not, yeah, not using as much energy. So they're in the draft um, of the other riders, which makes it a lot easier. Um, and then, yeah, if you come into a sprint, often we do a lead out. So you'll have the whole team lined out on the front of the bunch with our sprinter um, sitting in and you bring up the pace and each rider um, comes off one at a time and then sort of releases the sprinter um, at top speed so that, yeah, they can get across the line first. Which, I mean, it's, it, the way you're explaining it there is, is kind of exciting. It must be exciting to be part of and see the, the tactics all unfold in front of you. Yeah, I mean, a, a lot of it um, is a bit second nature to us when we do it all the time. But, um, yeah, basically, yeah, it is, it is quite full on and um, we get a lot of adrenaline, especially in those, like, fast-paced um high action finishes um, and it can be scary as well like it's a whole bunch traveling at 50 or more over 50 k's an hour um, coming into a sprint finish and yeah people knock elbows and um, yeah try and squeeze in and yeah it, it can be pretty scary in there. Well, I, I'd, I'd imagine it would be scary. I mean, on a much smaller scale, I, I happen to love Formula One, but it's a smaller scale because it's only two drivers per team mm -hmm. and the teams stand out like a sore thumb because of the painted cars, but they have, they have tactics too. They will have one of their team members leading and then not, and, and you can see the tactics around, you know, mm -hmm. pits, pit um, changes and all that. When you're actually racing in cycling, do you know who's who and what they're doing? Because I'd imagine you would know your team tactics, but the other teams wouldn't disclose their team tactics. Would that be right? Uh, that's right, but generally we are really familiar with um, all our other competitors and we know their strengths and weaknesses and before a race we, um, we sort of guess what the tactics of the other teams will be and some of it unfolds in the race. If someone does something, we're like, oh, okay, so they're actually doing this and um, this person's their leader today. You can sort of work it out from yeah, what, how it unfolds. 
Well, I mean, imagine this is uh, this is Super 2020 and I'll just Road, New to after this one. And it got underway with the red coats. Well, pretty, it's pretty exciting to have a musket starting a race, but this is um, this must be the Road National Time Trial, is that right? The uh, National Road Time Trial? Uh, yeah, National Road Race. Sorry, so, National Road Race, yep. Yeah. Yeah, so that was uh, the start of this year, and um, this is me with my uh, teammate Amanda Spratt. Off, we're in a group off the front of the race, so, so in that situation, we two of us and um, one other girl from another team. And because uh, my teammate was a better climber, better over this course than me, I basically sat on the front and drove the pace like the whole way. Um, and then she thankfully won the race. Otherwise, it would have been a lot of effort for, <laughs> for a second place. Well, I'm sure that happens a little bit. But if you were to look back at, you know, 12-year-old Grace, what advice would you give to 12-year-old Grace now, knowing that you, what, everything you know now? Um, I would say don't be afraid to hurt. Don't be afraid to take um, some risks in life because... Yeah, generally um, you'll have a better outcome from taking a risk than uh, than not at least, yeah, at least you get a chance at something and it usually turns out all right. That's great advice and, and I'd imagine you'd also say to her that brace yourself, you're going to break a collarbone and they'll have you back on the bike in a week because that is unheard of, I must say. And as a 12-year-old as a growing up in the country though, was, was there added layers of complexity being in a country and because Camperdown is not exactly local, was that hard to, to get the right training, to get the right parts, um, to have the right sprint spot, uh, cross country spikes, all of that? Um, uh, it wasn't. It wasn't too hard uh, for for cross country. Like it's pretty easy to just go and run around a block. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and I think yeah, I would have to come to. I'd have to go to Geelong to get proper running shoes and stuff like that but it wasn't yeah we managed it would have been a little bit more difficult I think if I was cycling when I was in Camperdown um because it's a lot more equipment focused um yeah. but yeah I started cycling once I was in Melbourne right yeah and I, and I guess you're right the running um would have been would have lent itself to cross-country kind of running when you're running around a, a big paddock or a farm of of some sort I, I guess you know if if there was a teenager listening in who wanted to represent Australia one day, what would you say to that person? Um, I would say that there's no rush. Um, particularly, yeah, there's, there's always a sport um, that uh, you can excel at that, you know, you don't have to be at the top of your game when you're 16 or younger. Um, I started cycling when I was 23. I'm now mm. 28 and, um, yeah, and I'm up there racing with the top cyclists in the world. So, um, yeah, you don't, have to, you don't have to peg yourself into one sport or put pressure on yourself to be the best um, when you're a teenager. You've got plenty of time and, yeah, you can make mistakes along the way and, and you'll still get there if you dream big enough. Do you pinch yourself thinking about where you're at right now? Because, you know, like I said, you've had a blistering 2020. 2018 and 19 were amazing as well. You've only been in the sport a few years. You mentioned you started at 23 years old. I won't mention how many years because it'll give away your age, but you've only <laughs> been in a few years. Yeah. Therefore, in such a short span of time, it's not quite... I'd imagine it's not normal for someone to have achieved as much as you've achieved in such a short amount of time. Is that right? Uh, yeah, no, it's not. Um, it's not particularly normal. Most of the girls that I race against overseas have been cycling since they were yeah. teenagers. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's it's doable. Um, yeah, I, I mean, like you just have to throw yourself in the deep end a bit, like. And, and take a few chances um, and believe in yourself. But, yeah, I mean, I I had some pipe dreams when, um, I mean, I, like, yeah, I had, I've always had pipe dreams of where I would love to be and um, most of the time I've been, I've thought that that's, 
you know, too far away and I'll never get there. But if you just keep putting one foot in front of the other and um, try and be a better version of yourself, a better athlete every single day, then eventually, you know, those pipe dreams are, are proper goals that you can achieve. So, um, yeah, it's, it's a matter of ticking away and working on yourself every day and not, yeah, not getting overwhelmed by the big picture. Yeah, I mean, that's a more great advice that you're giving there because it, it is, it's the baby steps, it's the daily steps that lead to the overall goal. If we were to fast forward 10 years from now, what, what would you have liked to have achieved without putting pressure on yourself? What, what is it that you'd like to say, I did that? Um, well, yeah, my, my next goal is uh, to, be, to make the Olympic team for 2021 in Tokyo. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, you know, I'd like to be an Olympian. Um, and then there's some big races in Europe that I would like to win. So, yeah, I think if I, if I achieve those, I'll be, um, yeah, really proud of, of what I do. That's exciting. Now, what? just briefly, what's involved in being selected for an Olympic team in cycling? Yeah, it's, um, it's not really black and white like some other sports. Um, yeah. We have <clears throat> some races that are uh, sort of selection races, but it's, um, you know, you can get uh, results in those. So if you get podium results in a couple of those, then that puts you in really good stead. We may have lost Grace, unfortunately. I don't know if she can hear me or not. She's gone. All right. So I think <clears throat> I'm still coming through, but <clears throat> we will check in and make sure that Grace can jump back on board. But it was working pretty darn well. But unfortunately, she's dropped out. So we'll see what happens there. I think I might just refresh and see what happens. No, she's oh. back. You're back. Right. <laughs> um, <clears throat> yeah, so I was talking about Olympic selection. Um, yeah, they were, so we form a team around one rider. Um, so one rider will be the person that we want to get a result at the Olympics, and then we have uh, three other riders that will help um, yeah. get there. <laughs> so, yeah, but, but basically it, it's going to be the top four riders um, from Australia and that that's based on our race results um, and also some data so we have power meters on our bike so you can sort of predict what um, attributes as a rider will be good on the course in Tokyo yeah pretty exciting stuff and, and you know I mean Tokyo 2021 will be <laughs> a, a massive build-up because we've been waiting for it for over a year um, it, you know how has COVID impacted you as a person, as an athlete this year? Yeah, it's, uh, well, it put our um, racing season on hold for, I think, five months. We, um, we started off in March and then it quickly all came crumbling down um, and everything was cancelled. And then we restarted again in late July. Um, so there was a long period of uncertainty um, then and I was over in Europe I came back to Australia um, and yeah really just had to you know train without knowing when I'm going to race next um, which is yeah it's really challenging um, and yeah you could sort of see when we went back to racing which, which people coped with that um, and which struggled a little bit more um, but I, I found it okay in the end. I just um, used it as an opportunity to do a bigger, like, base load of training than I usually would. So it was, yeah, I, I found it really good actually and um, was able to build my form more over that period than, um, than I had been in the past. 
And was that a, a, a nice surprise when you got back on the track and back into racing that your improvements were seen? You saw the rewards for your work? Yeah, yeah, it was really good um, getting back to racing and realising that I'd yeah, been able to step it up another level. Um, yeah, that's cool. <laughs> but, yeah, the COVID, the COVID situation in Europe is um, quite, uh, oh, quite different to here and we, ha we had heaps of different um, protocols around racing and had to be in race bubbles with the team so we didn't have any interaction with the outside world, no spectators at races. So, yeah, it was a very okay. different year. Well, it would have been. I know I've talked a little bit um, to you throughout this year, but you kind of um, would... COVID was chasing you. You left Melbourne and we were going into lockdown and then you went over to Europe and then that went nuts so you came back here. So, I mean, it's you've managed to escape it because I wouldn't imagine it would be a, a good thing to have for anyone. What does a typical week look like? Let's put COVID aside. What does a typical week look like in a, in a week, in a, um, a time when you're trying to peak as an athlete? Because many people may not know you're also married as well so you're trying to trying to maintain a, a healthy marriage relationship and do training but what does it look yeah. like for you yeah well um luckily when i'm trying to peak i'm not usually um at home <laughs> so i don't have to juggle that the personal relationship aspect um as much but yeah uh for each individual athlete it's a little bit different what you need to peak but i um I've found that I do really well from like uh, a really hard block um, of training right before a target race. And um, yeah, sometimes I use other races to build my form because that's yeah. like um, a higher intensity from racing than is easy to get in training in a way. Um, but yeah, a week I'd be doing uh, probably 20 hours on the bike. Um, and unfortunately, it looks like we've lost Grace just as, just again. Um, hopefully, she'll be back soon. She'll probably turn herself off and come back on. She's back. <clears throat> All right, you're back. No, that's fine. It's not. It's not. It's not you. It's nothing personal. It's just when you're in the city, um, a lot of people are using the internet and, and using data. I'd imagine. Imagine if everyone was working from the city because you know it's quite a lockdown at the moment. But um, just keep going with what you the, the thought you had. Oh. Nope, gone altogether. All right, so it looks like we might have lost Grace altogether. So we're, we might finish it there. Um, we'll end it on... Um, that's unfortunate. Look, you can be in touch with Grace through social media. Um, we've put Instagram in the show notes. But this is uh, kind of awkward, but we'll um, end it with the video and we'll go from there. <laughs>